Philippines. I'm also a volunteer at Cyber Season Organization. And today we have dear guest Shreen Razak, who stands out Victoria Gender Studies. And I would like to thank you very much for uh, joining us, not refusing our invitation. We are very happy and honored to see you among us. Thank you very much for coming again. Uh, so now on, I'll leave the floor to our French Padma to explain what Cyber Season is and what purposes it's working on as always before letting go our open lecture. Uh, hello everyone, I am Fatma and I want to talk about who we are. We are a group of students from Boaz University, Church Language and Literature de Department, and we arrange open lectures with the name of Real Literature in Turkish service season. We want to gain our safe and free environment and we consider these lectures as a first step. So why do we arrange open lectures? As you know, since the night of January 2, the undemocratic rector appointment has threatened our safety democratic and free environment. We care about democratic and free universities, and we want to support resistance with the discipline of literature. We, as living in Turkey and studying at Boğaz University, know our constitutional rights. Therefore, we will continue to advocate our rights, and we will resist. We won't be silent against undemocratic appointments, police harassment and violence, unjust detention and arrest. We aim to create an alternative and safe, safe environment in which we can discuss freely and we can keep our resistance active. Finally, we consider this rector appointment as an attack on our rights, culture and autonomy. And we say we do not accept, we do not give up and we never look down. Thank you. Um, thank you, Padma, for your speech. Now I leave the floor to Shaima to talk about the general state of our school and our resistance. Thank you, Jemre. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to talk about how the situation is and uh, what we want. Contrary to the traditional way of electing a rector with the votes of faculty members, Mehmet Özkan was appointed as director in 2016, although he didn't have the majority of the votes. However, with the appointment of Melih Bulu as director in 2021. Someone from outside appointed our university for the first time since 1980s. Although we have stated from the first day that we do not want an appointed director, our resistance, which started with the ignoring of our demands, continues to grow stronger from the first day, despite all the policies of intimidation, policies of intimidation. During this period, our university was blocked by the police. Our friends who resisted injustice and reached thousands of people were detained by battering. Some of them were even subjected to strip searches. Hundreds of uh, people were judged, judged by uh, judicial control. Dozens of people were under house arrest and 11 of our friends were arrested. Finally, uh, an unprecedented trickery has been carried out in our university history to capture the numerical majority in our Senate. At the Senate meeting held in recent weeks, the appointed directors uh, and vice uh, chancellors uh, attempted to change their names and vote from different devices in order to use their appointed positions in the meeting. Against this sneaky move, our legitimate senators left the meeting. Despite all this, we want to repeat our rightful demands and once again while continuing our resistance as one the first day. On the first day, all appointed people, especially Melih Bulu, must resign immediately. All our friends under house arrest must be released. Higher education institution, which is a cop institution, must be closed. The police who blockaded our campuses must leave our school immediately. Our university directors should be determined determined by an election that includes all components of universities. Finally, fundamental human rights and all constitutional rights of all LGBT plus people should be recognized. The club status should be returned to the LGBT plus studies club whose activities are stopped at our school. We do not accept, we do not give up. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for Shema. And now I just want to say something a little before we start. If our guests have a question, they can send their questions to our friend named Ask Me uh, through a private chat, and we can ask your questions to our lovely guest, Shreen Razak. Um, so if everything is clear, uh, let's start our open lecture. Now I will share with you the biography of our guest, Shreen Razak. Um, 
Shirin Razak is a Canadian postcolonial feminist scholar, author, and activist of West Indian origin. She is best known for her contributions to feminist and critical race studies canon about discrimination against Muslim and indigenous women in Canada. Razak lived in France and attended La Université Hoyt Britannia, now called the University of Rennes II, uh, where she obtained her diploma in French studies in 1976. The following year, Razak moved back to Canada to continue her studies at the University of British Columbia, where she earned a bachelor's degree and honors in history. Continuing her field of work, Razak completed a master's degree in the same subject, history, in 1979 at the University of Ottawa. Razak's postdoctoral degree in the field of education was completed in 1989 at the University of Toronto, uh, where she teaches today. In 2005, Razak co-founded Trace, which is um, the researchers and academics of color for equality, and Network of scholars dedicated to feminist and anti-racist studies. Today, Razak is a professor in the social justice department at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education of the University of Toronto. Razak previously taught women's studies for two years at the Simon de Beauvoir Institute at Concordia University. And now I want to leave the floor to the Shreen Razak for her speech. Thank you. I think we cannot hear you. Okay, just a minute. There. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, and and hi. Uh, let me just correct briefly that uh, that that biography is a bit out of date. I have been teaching for the last five years at the University of California at Los Angeles, in the Department of Gender Studies. Uh, so uh, that's a big, uh, a big change. Um, and uh, I am the uh, Penny Canner Endowed Chair in, in Gender Studies. Uh, okay, so um, let me, uh, let me start uh, with this. Uh, first of all, it, it, it was very good to hear something of your context. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know uh, enough about it. Um, and because I don't know much about the specific academic background or interests uh, that, that you have, I decided rather selfishly, perhaps, to speak to you about a persistent analytical problem that I face in my work on racial violence. And I'm primarily a scholar of, of racial violence. So the problem in a nutshell is sex. The site of racial violence, the place where, you, if you like, where it seems to live is sex. The sex is required to carry the racial animus. Rape, for instance, is often the act that imprints racial power on the body. In the example I discussed today, white men express their own racial power over indigenous women through rape that is followed by murder. These acts reveal an unimaginable fury, which is the title of the book I'm trying to write at the moment, an unimaginable fury directed at the indigenous woman's body. The fury is analogous to the kind of fury you see in police shootings of black and brown and indigenous men. For example, police directed 40 bullets at Abner Luima, a black man. The difference, however, in the case of indigenous women is that the fury is always deeply sexualized and occurs in the act of rape. Of course, one sees sexualized fury in other lethal acts of racial violence, and this, I believe, is significant. For example, white men who lynched African Americans caressed their victims' genitals before lynching. We see that the torture of Arab prisoners at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and other places is often, if not always, sexualized. The prisoners were naked at Guantanamo, at uh, Abu Ghraib and posed into pyramids, presented as though they were engaging in sexual acts with each other. Reported as a special form of humiliation, one cannot understand these acts of sexualized torture 
without asking what is the sex doing for the torturers? Is it doing the same thing that it does for the killers of indigenous women? Is it expressing racial power in the most intimate way possible? I've tried to think about what the sex is doing in torture and other acts of racial violence for several decades, believing that when we understand this, we will have a better idea of what racial violence is, how it might be gendered, and crucially, what it does. We will understand more, I, I believe, but the questions persist for me, and that's why I took the, the opportunity today to reflect on my thinking with you. So there's a big warning up front. I don't have answers. I am simply asking for a conversation and your help in thinking through racial violence. Perhaps your own unique contexts will enable you to think through some of the quagmires in the, in the argument. But for now, I take you to the North American context. It's a bit of a long story and I'm, I'm, I don't know whether the context is familiar to you. It occurred to me that I should have had a nice fancy PowerPoint to help matters along, but that feels a bit too reductive. I'm aiming for a conversation in a medium that is ill-suited to it. So let's begin. First of all, an immediate clarification. The words indigenous and aboriginal are words that are used interchangeably here because of the various legal contexts I discuss for both Canada and the United States. So I'd like to begin with the words of two judges, Alvin Hamilton and Murray Sinclair, who were commissioners of a special inquiry, the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry of Manitoba, which is a province in Canada, way back in 1991. In this inquiry, the two judges conclude their analysis of the murder of 16-year-old Helen Betty Osborne, an Indigenous schoolgirl in the town of De Pa, Manitoba, who was brutally murdered by four white men. And what the commissioners conclude, and here's how they put it, there is one fundamental fact her murder was a racist and sexist act. Betty Osborne would be alive today had she not been an Aboriginal woman. What I've been trying to think about is this fundamental fact. Helen Betty Osborne would not have been killed had she been an Aboriginal woman. And perhaps I wish the judges would have added, would not have been killed this way. Her killing is inextricably linked to her race. The judges took an unusual step. In 1991, it was very unusual and it remains very unusual to call this kind of killing a racial act. Their report was in 1991, as I've said. We now know, if we didn't before, through a Canadian national inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women, a phenomenon that has its own abbreviation, MMIW, we now know that the killing, the sexualized killing of Indigenous women is widespread. It's a phenomenon. More than two decades have passed since the judges have de declared so unambiguously that what happened to Betty Osborne was entirely due to the fact that she was an indigenous woman. The claim is unequivocal. They're not saying it's really about gender or it's really about class. They're actually saying it's really about race, pure and simple. This sentence has haunted me for my entire scholarly career, which actually began shortly after this inquiry. Is this a different kind of racial violence from the violence directed at indigenous men in settler colonies? How are the two forms of violence related? In my last book, Dying from Improvement, I wrote in non-gender specific terms for the most part 
about the annihilative impulse that is at the heart of settler colonialism. I argued that in settler colonial societies, the Indian must disappear if the settler is to have indigenous land, oil, diamonds, minerals. Both the idea and the reality of the disappearing Indian is a productive one for the settler. Through it, the settler becomes the original citizen, both materially and symbolically. And because Gaza is on my mind and Israel is a, a white settler colony is on my mind, I cannot help but think here of uh, who becomes the original citizens and how you do that through the disappearing of the indigenous population. Disappearing the Indian is a complex, multifaceted project. A.J. Moses has argued that from time to time, the settler state radicalizes, moving in genocidal moments from assimilation to full-on destruction. The multifaceted racial infrastructure of the settler state is designed to disappear Indians in many ways, from the systematized impoverishments of reserves, the maintenance of spaces devoted, as Foucault would have put it, to letting die rather than making live, to the spaces where violence against indigenous people is allowed to occur with impunity. Spaces we might call, after a gambon, spaces of exception. Drawing attention to the disposability of indigenous populations who are scripted as outside of the modern, Scholars have used the prefix necro to describe settler colonial, colonial and capitalist regimes. And Bambi began this trend with his article Necropolitics. The material destruction of bodies and populations where terror becomes intrinsic to politics occurs in places marked as zones of death. Sovereignty means occupation, and occupation, in Mbembe's words, means relegating the colonized into a third zone between subjecthood and objecthood. Shaira Vadasarya offers the term necro-nationalism to discuss the purging of indigenous corporeality and the connection between death and nation in Israel-Palestine. More recently, the American scholar Nikkei Singh has written, and I quote him, of the necro-capitalist prerogative and the kinds of corporeal violence that could be visited on slaves without or with minimal legal sanction in America. Singh emphasizes, and I quote him again, the quasi-hallucinatory genocidal force that never entirely vanishes in the settler colonial project, a force that is aimed at indigenous and black populations. Significantly, when scholars consider the genocidal basis of settler societies, they most often refer, as Singh does, to the conquest slash commodification of black bodies, as well as the conquest slash commodification of indigenous lands. But what is obscured in this sentence is indigenous bodies. It is as though indigenous bodies have already disappeared from the landscape and we no longer need to consider their destruction. So I'd like to start by saying that while it is certain, as Mbembe argued, that any, rise, any account of the rise of modern terror needs to address slavery, it is equally the case that such accounts must consider the corporeal basis to processes of indigenous dispossession. In effect, we must address the settler state's compulsion to disappear Indians. Michael Tossig alerted us to terror directed at indigenous people some time ago, processes he also described as having a hallucinogenic quality. I've taken my cue from his work, among others, in trying to understand the tremendous excessive violence, the unimaginable fury that is directed against indigenous women and the high tolerance of it in law and society. I'm drawn to the hallucinogenic quality of colonial violence, its terroristic features, 
and crucially, its regenerative function. That is to say, its function as the violence that gives birth to the settler himself or herself and to the settler state. So my project is one that attends to gendering disposability and terror, an attention to how colonial power is imprinted on indigenous women's bodies. I'm drawn to the concept of extraction to explain this process, although I don't yet know, haven't fully made up my mind if it communicates all that I want it to. We see more readily macro extractive processes of the colonial project, for example, resource and mineral extraction, ongoing land theft and so on. And we pay less attention on the whole, I believe, to everyday extractive relationships, to the way in which indigenous bodies violated, neglected, annihilated, become the raw material for the making of the settler subject and the settler state. You'll note here that the st settler state rights power on the indigenous body very often through law when it approves of and makes possible the murders of indigenous people. The state expresses this power through its agents, the police, but also a whole uh, range of health professionals, teaching professionals, and so on. Alan Felding writing of the narrative of the body and terror in Northern Ireland, advanced the concept that the body is the material from which the state manufactures power. In his words, the surface of the body is the stage where the state is made to appear as an effective material force. I've previously applied Feldman's concept of the body as surface, where the state imprints power, to my analysis of torture. The tortured body is a place where the state manufactures its power. Torture writes the story of power on the body and on the social body. I want to advance the same idea with respect to the indigenous woman's body in settler colonialism. The surface of the indigenous body is where the settler imprints power in very specific ways, among them a gendered sexualized annihilation. When I focus on the making of the settler subject through violence, I find myself having to use concepts such as racial fantasy and haunting in an effort to describe the psychic landscape on which the settler subject makes himself through violence. Tracking the way in which killings come to be authorized or forgiven in law, I consider both the material and affective infrastructure of the settler state the systems that consolidate necropolitical structures of feeling. There are all kinds of difficulties relying on such concepts and I don't want to leave the impression that I have it all figured out. This is no time for paralysis, however, least of all from non-Indigenous scholars like myself. The list of missing and murdered Indigenous women continues to grow, inquiries notwithstanding. Courts are more lenient to people who kill Indigenous women and girls than to those victims who are not Indigenous. And crucially, Indigenous women are far more likely to be killed by a stranger than are other women. The grim statistics go on and on. You may know some of them. Suicide rates among Indigenous youth, uh, the death of Indigenous children in foster care, and yet, in spite of all this escalating violence, this is the time we might call, as Carmela Mardoka notes in her own work, the age of redress. When in Canada, there has been an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women, many universities are now announcing that they are seriously considering what it means to decolonize the university. Some of us are saying, be careful what you wish for, as inclusion, reconciliation, and redress become sites for reorganizing settler colonialism into a more efficient and violent project of accumulation. 
The bottom line is that the violence continues, whether in horrific acts of annihilation or as slow death. And it seems to do so no matter how much we talk about truth, reconciliation, decolonization, and redress. Amidst these new governmentalities, if you like, although I maintain in my own work that colonial states are always dedicated to the idea of improvement, the violence becomes absorbed in narratives of progress and reconciliation. But there is one figure who remains persistently in the shadows white men who engage in an often lethal violence against indigenous women. It is this figure that concerns me most and that I see as the key to unlocking what racial violence does. This figure is hard to track, slipping in and out of view in the official stories and records of indigenous deaths. So let me uh, uh, reflect for a minute on what it means to look for the white man in inquiries and reports about Indigenous women, missing and murdered Indigenous women. In my view, it will be impossible to decolonize unless we begin to name and analyze the nature, function, and extent of white men's violence against Indigenous women in a settler colonial state. We need to understand how what is done to indigenous women's bodies supplies the settler. So I'm sorry. Supplies the settler and the settler state with power. And sex might be key to that picture. Emphatically, this is not to say that we should not have a concern with indigenous men's violence towards indigenous women or for that matter, with violence perpetrated against Indigenous women by men of color. We should certainly not neglect the gendered dimensions of internal violence. Further, it is beyond a doubt that all the forms of violence directed at both Indigenous men and women are related. And in tracing their linkages and lineages, we gain insights into how violence against Indigenous women secures the colonial project. Today, however, my, my project is to focus on white men's violence, not only for the reason that this violence is seldom explicitly named, but because the omission is a, ser is a dangerous one. We miss something very significant about the violence directed at indigenous women by white men, whether that violence occurs in prostitution, policing, the justice system, or in everyday street encounters. What we miss is the very core of how the colonial project is made, namely an aggressive white masculinity, a self-making that is accomplished directly on the indigenous woman's body and given social and legal approval. Andrea Smith sum summed it all up pithily some time ago. Sexual violence is how you do colonialism. If sexual violence is how you do colonialism, projects that stand a chance of undoing colonialism, of decolonizing, must surely pay considerable attention to the violence white men direct at indigenous women through sex. Before I begin to chart how I've tried to think about it, I want to spend a bit of time on the present day in Canada, when I, you know, I did most of my research for the last 25 years, and now I teach in the United States. But in Canada, when I was teaching, uh, there began a, a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women. At, at the beginning of this process, the police, I, I, I'm convinced a police and state inspired distraction was circulated by the then conservative government. And what they said was 70% of the murders of indigenous women were committed by indigenous men. They were very fond of this statistic and circulated it widely. The final report of the missing and murdered indigenous women, the inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women makes clear that this statistic was a lie. And they even go so far 
as to focus on the fact that this statistic fed bias and stereotyping, it encouraged racism, and it did nothing to address the violence. I might note in passing that a very similar statistic was advanced by the Trump administration when they were trying to pass the Muslim travel ban. And the statistic that they circulated, they circulated a bunch, but essentially the conclusion was Muslim majority countries are engaging massively in honor killings. And you know, that became one of the reasons in all the legal briefs for, for defending the Muslim travel ban. So there's similarity in tactics across across uh, set of states and arguably across states. Perhaps you can talk about how your own state uh, deals with this. So how does the inquiry discuss white men's violence? Well, in general, the inquiry concluded there's no reliable estimate of the extent of the violence. In fact, at one time, the government simply stopped counting and refused to fund uh, indigenous women's groups who were doing the counting. So we don't know the extent. We don't know the causes. But they did say that there is a demonstrable indifference to indigenous life. These very broad findings were reached through documenting that murders and disappearances are very poorly investigated by the police, that there's a great deal of stereotyping of indigenous women. Families are seldom communicated with or respected by the police and everything is under-resourced and under-prioritized. But where the inquiry comes into its own analytically is when it took the chance to say that there is a deliberate race, gender, and identity-based genocide in progress. In describing the failure to protect indigenous women and girls, the deaths of women in police custody, exploitation and trafficking, murders by known killers, the crisis in child welfare, physical, sexual, and mental abuse inflicted in state institutions, the forced removal of children, the chronic underfunding of human services, et cetera, the inquiry said, this is evidence of genocide, a very bold step. Although I might have wished for even more plain speaking and perhaps a sharper analysis, this position is a clear recognition that the goal of the violence is the elimination of indigenous peoples and control over their land. Indeed, the inquiry even says on page 54, if you're looking, we should put all this violence down to colonialism and its presumption of superiority. Again, while I really wish they would have said white superiority and would have named white supremacy, nevertheless, I must you know, uh, salute that what is being recognized here is a project of annihilation. Genocide, they say, is the root cause of the violence. Judging by the furor that this, this description and analysis provoked, I would say that this is the inquiry's shining moment. But genocide is an argument that may be worth little if we cannot fill in the dots by naming how gender-based genocide is accomplished through the violence written on the indigenous woman's body. And in fact, we will still need to track the violence as a story of power written on the body. And it is this that proves to be so elusive. The inquiry offers very limited insight into how white men's violence against indigenous women occurs. They do say that the stereotype of the squaw refers to indigenous women as hypersexual a characterization that has enabled white men to be excused for the violence towards indigenous women. They gesture to the historical record and they note that police officers raped indigenous women with impunity and that the killers of indigenous women who were engaging in sex work were typically never called to account. Here, the Johns, the, 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 the clients of, of sex workers are never specifically racially characterized, 
but we can guess that they, the men are white. The inquiry could not ignore the testimonies of those such as Robin Bourgeois, who made plain that today's sexual violence is dismissed by the police and the courts, typically on the basis of the logic of the score stereotype. It could not ignore testimony that indigenous women had nowhere to turn when they are victims of violence. I'm very grateful that these things were named, but I'm nonetheless struck by how the macro picture of the violence, principally an indifferent justice system, still seems to skirt around the question of the systematized targeting of indigenous women by white men. It is possible that if one names white men, one exonerates others, and this would be false. But the fact remains that the context in which this violence occurs is one in which there are very few non-Indigenous men uh, of color. Uh, so naming their participation and talking about other players has the function of throwing us off the scent of white violence. We also ignore that the violence that non-Indigenous men of color may direct is part of a process of whitening, a bid to get into the club of colonizers. One place where one might expect a more forthright discussion of the violence is the context of resource extraction, which is arguably the economic heart of the colonial project. Here, although white men are not, not again, once again, explicitly named, we do find in the inquiry terms that offer some kind of clues as to what kind of encounter is actually unfolding in resource extraction. The term transient worker, for instance, is used to refer to the workers of mining camps who engage in high levels of sexual harassment and violence. There is a section in the inquiry's report specifically dedicated to resource extraction projects. And the relationship to violence is explore, explored more thoroughly here. We learn, for example, of the male construction workforce and the extensive violence that prevails in such environments as hydroelectric development. Here is the inquiry's analysis. I quote, the arrival of a largely male construction workforce led to the sexual abuse of indigenous women. People spoke of construction workers getting them inebriated and then taking advantage of them. People spoke of witnessing rape and being unable to interfere. Some spoke of instances of institutions that were meant to protect indigenous women, such as the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, brutalizing indigenous men and permitting the exploitation of women failing to take local complaints seriously. Indigenous children felt themselves to be the target of racial violence and so on. So we learn about extractive workers, that's their term, who transmit diseases to indigenous women who engage in rape and assault. This type of violence is attributed to boomtown economics, the in-migration of young men, hyper-masculine camp cultures, as well as rural contexts where young men with high salaries and little stake in host communities, fueled by the increased consumption of alcohol and drugs, engage in violence. There is too a culture of impunity. As one retired Aboriginal support worker summed it up for the inquiry, racism in the oil patch is sometimes obvious, but most of the time it is very subtle. There is an assumption that if you're an indigenous woman, you're an easy lay. Some oil patch men prey on indigenous women. Finally, the report highlights the proliferation of sex work in relation to the extractive industry, stating the stigma surrounding commercial sex, the fact that commercial sex is largely criminalized or that illegal drugs are involved may make women who sell sex reluctant to report violence for fear of mistreatment and punishment. Okay, it would appear from all of these descriptions and analysis that resource extraction produces a context where economically advantaged men exploit 
economically marginalized women who happen to be indigenous. If I'm dissatisfied with this description and analysis, it is because it does not prompt us to come to the same conclusion as the two judges with whom I began with respect to Helen Betty Osborne. Remember that the judges said Osborne was killed because she was Aboriginal. Here, the story of power that the men write on the women's bodies is a story of economic power in the specific context of the oil patch. It is not primarily a story of racial or colonial power. That they write this story of power through sexual violence is also naturalized. There isn't a long enough pause on the context of the sexual violence. We learn that powerful men simply express their power through sexual violence. It is what it is. There is a slightly more forthright examination of violence against Indigenous women in Amnesty International reports on violence against Indigenous women. For example, its report in the, on the um, intensive energy development in the Peace River region of, of Northeast British Columbia, which is the westernmost province in Canada. This report is a good place to start thinking further about everyday extractive relationships, sex and racial power. So the report by Amnesty is called Out of Sight, Out of Mind, Gender, Indigenous Rights and Energy Development. And this report, I believe, is to be lauded for the uncompromising stand that it takes that violence against Indigenous women and girls in areas where resource extraction is underway is pervasive and normalized. Further, Amnesty International also insists that the violence emerges in the context of settler colonialism where broken treaties and a persistent impoverishment of Indigenous communities provide what I would like to call the racial infrastructure in which the violence thrives. The report breaks down the violence directed at indigenous women into three categories, domestic violence, violence in the workplace, and violence at the hands of social acquaintances and strangers. Although not named as white, we can again safely assume that the violence in the second category, the workplace, and in the third category with strangers principally involves white men. Indeed, the, the indigenous nations of Unistotan and Wet'suwet'en peoples have made very clear the impact of the presence of white men who are in proximity to indigenous communities. So when uh, indigenous people talk about uh, the man camp culture, that's those are their words, uh, the work conditions, etc. in their environment, they talk about the fact that it destroys the ability for women to practice ceremony on the land, uh, that this is an imposition of white men in their spaces, and principally that white men regard indigenous women as objects. We should consider then that while it is often an exercise in finding Waldo to trace white men's violence towards indigenous women, the evidence from indigenous peoples themselves is nonetheless all around. We have been hearing of Manitoba Hydro's uh, generating station where the police is investigating nine sexual assault cases where Manitoba First Nations communities have demanded an inquiry into human rights violations. Journalists have reported that petroleum companies acknowledge what they say are their safety concerns. They engage in safety measures such as vehicle tagging where company vehicles can be identified so that transient workers cannot enjoy the anonymity that protects them. When I read of such measures, I can hardly breathe trying to imagine what it means when we have to tag vehicles in case they turn out to be driven by men who routinely prey on indigenous women. The violence takes on a banal vernacular quality and it doesn't seem to give us enough pause. 
why is violence against indigenous women such an everyday and anticipated condition of resource extraction? There are other frightening things men mentioned in the amnesty report that seeks to this banalization of violence. For instance, men and in vehicles routinely follow indigenous women. But of special interest to me is how such things are explained. We learn that young men are statistically more likely to be the perpetrators of violent crime, that men will blow off steam, and that indigenous women are economically vulnerable and have to turn to sex work, which carries stigma. The end result is that 93% of indigenous women surveyed report having experienced violence, although it is clear that the violence also begins in their own home. 34% of murders of indigenous women are considered are committed outside the home, as compared to 12% for non-indigenous women. I will acknowledge one thing that the amnesty report is good at. And that is in explaining the colonial histories that have led to the situation in, for, in the first place. They map the actual theft of land, the legal endorsements of the theft, and the harshness dealt to the occupied, namely systemic racism in policing, unprecedented damage to communities, and above all, a relentless pursuit of wealth accumulation, accumulation building dams without stopping so other than a quarrel with how it is too little noted that this violence represents a targeting of indigenous women rather than a casual exploitation of their vulnerabilities, you might be asking yourself, what is her problem? Why is sexual violence how you do colonialism? And how do you stop such a systematized, sanctioned and very targeted brutality and annihilation. I don't think we will get far, as I have been saying, if we don't attempt to focus on the features of this very specific encounter. And so this is, in a nutshell, my project. So I set about retracing my steps in this direction over the past 25 years. I was thinking maybe the book should you know, be, begin with how have I tried to, to think about this? So in retracing my steps, I realized actually somewhat with, uh, you know, a bit of um, shamefacedness, I realized that it really all began for me analytically with Helen Betty Osborne, the woman I mentioned at the very beginning. The Aboriginal Justice Inquiry's account of her death is the first moment that I personally began to try to understand racial or colonial violence through sex. Betty Osborne was a 19-year-old Indigenous Cree schoolgirl from Norway House Indian Reserve who was abducted and brutally murdered near the town of De Palm, Manitoba, where she attended school in 1971 and boarded with a white family. Four white men were involved in her death and it was not until 1987, 16 years later, that one of them was convicted for her murder. The entire town of De Palm, Manitoba knew of this and kept silent about it for two decades. So I came to know about Osborne's murder through the report and the conclusion that I mentioned at the beginning, that Betty Osborne would be alive today if she were not Aboriginal. This remains so remarkable to me. It is telling though, that I didn't always remember Betty Osborne and the circumstances of her murder as I made my way through my scholarly life, looking at gender violence. Because she was Aboriginal is the phrase that lingered on the edges of my scholarly consciousness without making a deep enough impression. Is this outcome linked to the fact that I am not Indigenous and I'm too far removed from Indigenous realities? Perhaps I am too steeped in a Western education and Western feminism to have understood 
how central the violence against indigenous women was and is to settler colonialism. Bearing in mind that the commissioners reached their conclusion in 1991, it is still rare. In fact, I cannot cite a single instance where a similar analysis has prevailed in law. I want to just quote their words in full. It is clear that Betty Osborne would not have been killed if she had not been Aboriginal. The four men who took her to her death from the streets of the Pa had gone looking for an Aboriginal girl with whom to party. They found Betty Osborne, and when she refused, she was driven out of town and murdered. Those who abducted her showed a total lack of regard for her person or her rights. Those who stood by while the physical assault took place, while sexual advances were made, and while she was being beaten to death, showed their own racism, sexism, and indifference. Those who knew the story and remained silent must share the guilt. The commissioners go on to ask, what did it mean to be Aboriginal and female in a white town in 1971? Commissioners Hamilton and Sinclair do not waver in their answer. Their answer, young Aboriginal women were objects with no human value beyond sexual gratification. And they insist many white people shared in this belief and acted upon it, preying on Aboriginal girls and women to endorse and approve these pursuits. If the report on Betty Osborne's death betrays uncertainty, it is in how to understand the behavior of the white collective, a phrase I'm borrowing from Leslie Thielen Wilson and which the commissioners did not use. It is a phrase that I would recommend for its capacity to fill out the picture of gender-based genocide. When I reflect on why I keep returning to Helen Betty Osborne and to the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, it has to do with their efforts and arguably their failed efforts to describe the white collectivity in a more fulsome and direct manner. I would have liked them to use stronger words, but I must stop and think that they did manage to say the most important thing. They asked us such questions as, were the white people of the Par Manitoba simply misinformed about Aboriginal people, culturally ignorant, unfamiliar? They rehearse each explanation, but every time that they do, these explanations take them too far away from the moral chasm that must be crossed when you collectively collectively, emphasis on that word, turn a people into objects available for sexual violation and annihilation. Would we say, for example, that slavery was a cultural misunderstanding? I know that Republicans are currently trying to do that by outlawing uh, you know, any kind of teaching or seminars like this one on the 619, 1619 project. Would we say that slaveholders simply didn't understand the cultures of Africa? Most of all, whether viewed as cultural misunderstanding or racial prejudice, which is another masterful understatement, neither explanation explicitly connects the violence of the settler collective to land. Notwithstanding this telling inability to describe collective white behavior, the commissioners do not abandon their insistence that Betty Osborne's murder must be understood within the context of a colonial society. So how did they set about doing this anti-colonial analysis? What words did they use? The identification of Betty Osborne's faith as one tied to her indigenous status and the commissioner's attempt to consider a collective racism is what should compel us, even though as a scholar, I grimace and, and, and you know, tighten my, my, my stomach when I think of some of the words they tried to use or the concept they tried to use, words which are entirely inadequate 
to capturing this violence, words such as racial prejudice. The glimpses, though, that they offer of an apartheid settler town and their own measured attempts to name the violence of an ongoing colonial situation pushed them and should push us to examine the histories and the geographies of settler violence and specifically its gendered aspects. It is deeply significant that the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry's report on the death of Helen Betty Osborne begins with a map depicting the province of Manitoba, the location of Osborne's home reserve of Norway House and its distance from the Pa Manitoba, the town where Osborne went to attend high school, the map enables the commissioners to make their first point. At the age of 17, Osborne had to leave home to pursue an education because there was no schooling available in her home community beyond grade eight. First attending a residential school where, as the commissioners emphasize, assimilation of indigenous students was the goal, and then transferring to the town of Depa, Betty Osborne's educational and social context was a fully colonial one. The map and the opening paragraphs of the report make clear that Osborne's situation is a historical and a structural one. Aboriginal people do not enjoy the same educational environment as others, and when they leave home for education, they must board with foster families in a white town. The commissioners begin their report by notice, noting that the Cree have inhabited this region for 5,000 years. They also note the creation of reserves and the ensuing controversies surrounding treaties. In emphasis and content, their description of Dupa, Manitoba exactly mirrors that of noted anti-colonial theorist Frantz Fanon in her description of colonial Algeria. Fanon wrote of the native town and the colonizer's town and emphasized that these were two distinct worlds. The commissioners, I don't know if they were silently invoking Fanon, that seems unlikely, but they write that the white and native communities were worlds apart. They say members of each community were clearly identifiable to the other and skin color immediately seemed to raise feelings of fear, suspicion and dislike. If Fanon's colonial world divided into compartments is rendered here as a world where very few Aboriginal people were employed in the town and where the communities are described as estranged, the circumstances of Aboriginal students who boarded in white homes disrupt any possibility that the Pa Manitoba was a kinder, kinder gentler place than was, than was colonial Algeria. Borders, the commissioners note, are not treated like family members. They are often confined to the kitchen and to their bedrooms and are not allowed to watch children and are not treated as the other children in the household. Here for me is an important everyday encounter, indicator of the kind of encounter that was unfolding in the Pa Manitoba, a fully colonial one which we cannot disguise. The separateness, the judges call it, should be considered as an expression of racism. If Osborne did not appear to have any white friends and had only a distant relationship with the white community, we learned that the town itself maintained a very strict apartheid. Indians were not allowed to sit in the same areas as whites in cinemas and restaurants a situation the commissioners analyze as one due to unconscious racism. It is more useful to think of this situation of apartheid prevailing on the streets and in intimate spaces as colonial, a spatiality and a sociality born of specific economic and political conditions. Two other concepts can be added here, concepts that the commissioners did not use, but which I believe they described. Those concepts are racial terror and policing as racial infrastructure. 
Police officers told the commissioners of the HAI that they were familiar with stories of white men throwing Aboriginal men off of bridges. Ominously, the police also said they were quite well aware of white youth cruising the town, attempting to pick up Aboriginal girls for drinking parties and sex. But as they also said to the commissioners, it was not the practice of the police to stop the cars to see if the girls were of age or if they were going willingly. In contrast, the police described how they routinely stopped Aboriginal people, a racial profiling that they vigorously defended. The commissioners confronted with this kind of evidence conclude that the failures originate in a passive racism or a lack of concern based on ignorance and a lack of understanding of the other community. This of course would be better named as structural and colonial, but nonetheless, they are pinpointing something very specific. Today, I would wanna name this structure as racial infrastructure. The system such as policing that make racial terror possible. As I remind my own students, racial terror is a widespread and systematic brutality that is defended as necessary, a brutality that evicts from the circle of law and humanity those considered to be subhuman. Settler violence is supported by an infrastructure. The commissioners are very forthright about the fact that the police knew who killed L. Osborne and who was involved and they failed to bring the suspects in for questioning. Instead, they brought in Osborne's 17 year old boyfriend who fainted upon being shown a, a photograph of her battered face. The heartless method of interrogation, the commissioners say, is not acceptable. You really have to pause when you read these kinds of sentences in a report. One young woman, a close friend of Osborne's, was actually driven to a secluded spot in the bush, an uncanny mimicking of the murder scene. She was questioned there by police, thrown on the hood of the car, and the interrogation only stopped when she started to cry after being shown pictures of her mutilated friend. Osborne's family fared a little better. I want to point out here that we should not be inured to these incidents. I compare them to the banal ones we learn in, about in the two reports, the, the banal one of the marking of oil company cars so that we could see who are the men who prey on indigenous women. The commissioners face a difficulty that I really want to urge myself and you to overcome. And that is, what is the term we should use to describe this kind of violence? They use very understated terms, misunderstanding, prejudice, etc. More aligned with terror than racial misunderstanding, the murder fits awkwardly into this unstated prose. What can be said, for example, about the extreme violence, a violence so savage that the commissioners were compelled to comment that it was driven by some unimaginable fury. It's their phrase that I take. We often see the same excessive and sexualized violence in contemporary cases of murdered indigenous women. And it is this fury that I cannot get out of my mind. It is this reason that I've titled my book, Unimaginable Fury. When we think of the white settler collective, very few white individuals involved in this case behaved ethically. Witnesses did not come forward. White lawyers, some with high ranking positions were part and parcel of the attempt to ensure that the killers, one of whom was middle class, was acquitted of the murder and not charged of an, as an accessory. There were no Aboriginal persons on the jury, uh, etc. Clearly, the commissioners conclude to the people of Dupa, Manitoba, Betty Osborne was a person without identity. So how then to name these problems today? I think that from the AJI, I began to make the connection of race and racial violence to land, but I was slow about it. 
And what gradually became visible was the importance of racial geographies, beginning with the map. This was soon followed by my nascent awareness of racial terror and racial infrastructure. But at the end of the day, where I find myself is thinking about the masculinities and femininities that produce and are produced by settler colonialism. I sent you uh, two uh, articles of my work. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to read it, but you will see from that that I tried to analyze the murder of Pamela George, a Cree woman who was murdered by two white college students who contracted with her for sexual services. I tried to follow the same sort of analysis as the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. Uh, and principally, I tried to answer the question, what brought these two white men to the prostitution area that night? And I argue that her killers, Pamela George's killers, knew themselves as entitled to her body, not so much for sex as, but maybe it's indistinguishable, as for an opportunity to practice a brutality that is unmistakable. Uh, this led me to ask again and again, what does the violence do? The sex suggests that what is taking place is a colonial encounter of the most intimate kind. And it is this colonial self-making that I continue to be uh, very um, interested in. Uh, for me, uh, one, one line that I keep pursuing is this landscape on which white men, as Richard Slotkin memorably put it in his work, regenerate through violence. They become white men through violence. One final wrinkle in this, I see that I have gone on very long. Uh, one, one final wrinkle in this is perhaps the biggest wrinkle for me right now, and that is the context of sex work. A considerable amount of these murders take place in sex work, although not all of them by any means. And it is this context that enables the court to reduce the culpability of the killers. Yet it seems to me that the only difference between Helen Betty, a 19 year old schoolgirl, and Pamela George, who was uh, a sex worker, is that the men paid for money to access an indigenous women's body. That's the only difference that I can see. And when I ask the question, what is the violence doing? I come once again to it's making colonizers. So this context of sex work has given me a lot of trouble. Uh, it's given me specific trouble with my students, uh, my North American students who would prefer to think of sex work as a, a kind of site where women uh, exercise their agency and engage in work, I have been accused of um, you know, not sufficiently recognizing the agency of women when I refuse to talk about sex work as work, as ordinary work, because I don't think it's ordinary work. I think it is a site of tremendous violence, perhaps a little bit of an epicenter of colonial and racial violence. And so this has led me into enormous trouble with my students. Um, and that, that is what I'm trying to work out. I sent you an article on the murder of Cindy Gladue. Um, very uh, extraordinary violence once again. The trucker, Bradley Barton, uh, inserted a knife into her vagina in the context of, of, of sex work. And his defense was that he paid for rough sex. Uh, he got off, but now he has been convicted at the final level. Um, and so I continue to want to think about what it means when some bodies exist as bodies and not as persons, and when there is a class of persons who can be caught, bought for the purpose of brutalizing. How do we think about that? I, I, I keep wanting to insist on, on, on that being on the table, even though my best friends advise me, give it a rest, stop quarreling with people about whether they use sex work or prostitution, uh, just get over it and start thinking about what happens at, at that site. Uh, and it seems evident to me that sex work is a space uh, where men go to assert their superiority, a place where one can breach bodily integrity for a price.
So uh, I, I'll just end by, by saying that where I am today is that the indigenous woman's body is a body that must be occupied. And that's where I want to continue thinking about it. I've also written about police violence against indigenous women. Uh, they're killing, uh, I can't remember if I sent that to you, but I want to leave it there. It has gone on unconscionably long and I would be very happy to have questions and have a discussion. Um, thank you very, very much for your speech. Um, now we have a question session and we would like to ask you a few questions. And again, as I said before, if our participants have questions, they can chat to our friend name Ask Me or they can directly raise their hands and we can ask you. Um, so is there any question that we can ask Zehra? Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, I got a question like that. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for the lecture. Uh, this is the question. As I understood, the concept of being other is used to leg legitimize violence. However, in defining someone as other, I have a question. How can we identify someone as other and what is the, bond what is the boundary of being other? It's a good it's a good question. I was once asked, you know, when I discussed an example of police killing of an indigenous woman, how did they know? How did the police know she was indigenous? And it's a kind of strange question given the environment that I was talking about because it was a, it was what is called in the United States a reservation border town, which is not a town between the border of Mexico and the US, but a town between the border of a reservation and uh, a white town, a town that is defined as a white town. And uh, I would say that um, as, as one judge from the 19th century once said, place makes race. <laughs> if you're in the place that is assumed to be the place of uh, degeneracy is assumed to be indigenous when you're in that space you're in it, you're assumed to be racially othered i would like to make an argument that sex work is one such space as long as you enter it regardless of whether you're white or not you are assumed to be racially othered uh, it's a difficult argument to make and i i uh, tell you it's it's not easy. It, I, I haven't succeeded totally but I do want to say that place makes race um, thank you for your answer now I see my rest hands and the floor is yours Myra okay uh... Thanks for the lecture, first of all. Uh, before asking, uh, I want to talk about a femicide case in Turkey. It's uh, regarding to my question. In 2020, Kurdish woman Fatma Altınbakas systematically sexu sexually assaulted by her spouse's uh, brother. She and her spouse, uh, Kazım Altınbakas, went to local police station and filed a complaint against uh, Sinan Altınbakas, but uh, Fatma didn't speak Turkish and the Kurd uh, Kurdish interpreted was not assigned for her. So officers didn't take her testimony. Uh, after uh, Sinan Altınbakas was released in two days, Fatma was killed by her husband. Uh, of course, this case has many different details and disregards, but I think the most uh, in uh, important disregard is that Kurdish interpreted was not assigned for Fatma, so officers didn't take her testimony. Uh, my question is that uh, what is the importance of language in the process of dehumanization and violence? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I, I Although I know only a little uh, about uh, the situation of Kurds in, in Turkey, I feel like I know enough. And there's been enough scholarship to indicate um, that that is a racialized group in, in Turkey, in the sense that um, it is a group, uh, you know, non-normative citizen. It's also associated again with land and 
and and and so on. So uh, you will know better than I how to whether that case stands up that that Kurds are racialized. Language is a major sort of racializing feature, of course. It's 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 absolutely um, central. It's not just skin. <laughs> it's it's language, and maybe think of language like a skin, and uh, clothing like a skin as well. You know what whatever you're wearing. Uh, so those are aspects of racialization, and and that example that you give, um, which you know. Uh, in, in the West, everybody rushes to call that an honor killing, uh, which of course, you know, to, to me looks like regular old fashioned, you know, domestic violence, et cetera, um, turning into murder. Um, I, I think it's interesting to try to think about not only this, this example of the language, which is to me very obviously sort of, part of racializing her and it led to her death, it, it contributed to her death, her killing. I, I think it's interesting to think about how the actual violence, which is, you know, her husband killed her, how that violence is perhaps related, sanctioned, uh, whatever, by the state. You know, that those things bear some thinking and we don't, we should not think of it in, in a way as to exonerate the husband that that is you know it's really a question of how patriarchy works through existing systems of of, of rule um openly racial ones openly colonial ones uh, class ones etc but how does that work all together i think that's a challenge for us that i would like to emphasize Um, thank you again. Now I see the Ebrar's hand. The floor is yours, Ebrar. Thank you, Gemma, and thank you, Razak, for your uh, really uh, mind-opening lecture. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, my camera is problematic and uh, I couldn't open it, but I want to ask you that your lecture was mainly concentrating on identities of victims through race. On the other side of medallion, I want to ask that people of disadvantaged races are exposed to violence of judiciary system uh, and judiciary system, our uh, system is always torturing and maybe threatening people of color, assuming them as uh, uh, potential criminals. And at that point, dehumanization becomes and means that criminalization of people of color and indigenous people, and uh, they are thrown away from public area because they're afraid of being criminals at, at any point because of the uh, policing system and for instance in a tv series maybe you heard about that a tv series adopted from a real life story when they see us um it was about black young children uh, they, they were accused of killing a white uh, woman ju white jugger woman mm. and they, they were very easily uh, accused and uh, they were they were sentenced like many years uh, without any evidence and they were totally innocent. Uh, what do you think about their criminalization in general uh, about people of color and indigenous? Well, it's important to think about you know what I was saying is the is the infrastructure that you need to make a colonial or a racial state work. If, if you're gonna set up a racial state, you're gonna need some things. You're gonna need policing. You know, there used to be that game, uh, my sons played Sim City, where you could make the city that, that you wanted and, and you were allowed to sort of give resources to whatever you wanted to do to make your city. And it, it was clear that if you want your city to really work, you need a lot of police, you need a lot of bullets, you need a lot of, you know, you need a justice system that works in a certain way. So I, I try to think about, you know, what are the things on which the process depends? How do you, how do you get a racial state, a capitalist state, a colonial state? Well, you need a certain kind of justice system where there are certain kinds of concepts that will structure the system. In the United States, for example, 
uh, you know, correctly called a slave nation, uh, there are sort of all these places in law where the prisoner is treated as a subhuman and things are allowed to be done to the prisoner. Now, this is regardless of whether the prisoner is white or not. The system itself has organized it so that slavery can continue by another means through this system. Uh, so for example, how do you defend segregation? How do you defend solit confinement, solitary confinement? You can't really do that unless you have a kind of structure in the law that will allow you to treat prisoners that way. And where does that come from? Straight out of slavery. So I think if you focus on infrastructure that we, we have a chance of understanding how power operates. Um, thank you for this impressive answer. First of all, Sartach, the floor is yours. Then Kibra, you can ask your question. Thank you, Jeremy, and hi, dear professor. Thank you for, thank you a lot for your time and the lecture you gave. I actually wonder the history of prostitution. As far as I know, it was first evaluated as sacrificing body for other sexual knowledge or teaching people sexual practices. Also, the job uh, prostitutes do about thousands of years ago was considered as if it was a sacred thing that everybody should respect. So what things have changed in people's perception about prostitution historically? And what are the main reasons for hate crimes that are committed to them except religions today? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I'm, I'm really glad that you, um, you recognize the need to historicize uh, this. Um, for me, uh, I actually made this argument some time ago. If you want the article, just email me and I can, I can send it to you. But modern prostitution, I feel uh, there's plenty of evidence and plenty of scholarship that this is a unique beast. <laughs> that is to say, for example, the, the um, major move um, to confine prostitution to areas of the city in, you know, uh, you getting that from sort of the reorganization of cities uh, beginning in the 18th century, uh, maybe even earlier. Um, I think we need to think about prostitution in a very historically specific way. We should really understand, for example, that it is a billion dollar industry um, and that it is central to a lot of middle power states achieving, you know, trying to survive. Uh, that, so it's not only the women trying to survive, it's the states surviving through what is generated from prostitution. So when, so you're talking about a, a very um, historically specific site, and we must pay attention to that when we analyze it and not sort of hide behind, you know, the standard world's oldest profession and things like that, that, that simply are um, ways of not understanding the social, historical, political, racial context of, of this structure. I think that that is very key. And if we did that, we would see that modern prostitution is, uh, is indeed uh, very important to the making of states, patriarchal states, racial states, et cetera. Um, it, it, I'm trying at the moment to write an essay, which, which will be very difficult to write, but I want to trace the emergence of the concept of sex work. Um, initially, it seems as though it actually emerged from gender studies departments and feminist scholarship. It certainly did not emerge from the ground <laughs> in terms of, of that. Um, who, who learned to call themselves a sex worker and who understood it as um, decent work or indecent work. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm trying to sort of trace those things as, as uh, we, we move along. And sorry, the next part of your question was about hate, hate speech. Can you repeat that? 
the main reasons for the hate crimes that are committed to them, except religion, religions to that. Hate crime in general? To prostitutes. Oh, through prostitution. Ah, except for religion. Well, I don't think it has much to do with religion at all. I think it 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 has everything to do with um, with uh, race and with a certain even when the 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 sex workers are are white. I think there is a kind of um, there is a performance of superiority, a coming to know yourself as a as a colonizer, as someone who can go anywhere and do anything and who is master over this particular body. I think all of those things are operating in, in, in that context. Um, it, in that way, it, it's not at all dissimilar to the way feminists generally understand um, violence, you know, gender-based violence. Violence makes the man is the, is the phrase. Um, so in that sense, yes, but, but we should not make the violence something um, so broad that we cannot see its function in various systems. Um, and similarly, that we, we should keep an eye on the mythologies we have about this violence. You know, the dominant view of prostitution I often find among my students is what I call the pretty woman view. You know, the movie Pretty Woman with Richard Gere? I have to stop saying that. Some of you are so young that maybe you didn't see it. But, you know, the idea that that the, the generous, kind, lovely prostitute who's who's forced to do this because she doesn't have money, but she's really likable and wonderful and he will marry her eventually. That is the story that we're getting. And we're getting that story even as the bodies pile up, which they are piling up. And even as we know really important things like the age at which girls get into sex work is really young. And somebody just told me, I haven't done the research yet, but Teen Vogue is a magazine that is actually now talking about sex work as a, as a possible career. Where is this coming from? And if we are implicated in this as feminists, we need to stop. Um, so, if we don't have a questions, I don't see a raised hands. And our question session may be ended. Um, it was a really beneficial and instructive lecture for us. We really appreciate it. And thank you again for coming. It was an honor to host you, uh, Kira Kim. So um, the last question is yours. Yeah, sorry, uh, I, uh, Zoom told me and I am reappointed. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank for your um, uh, this beautiful lecture, uh, dear Razak. Um, uh, I want to uh, ask a question about law and punishments of um, predators. Uh, do you think? men's financial and uh, social power has an effect on a predator's punishment and influence in court. Um, for example, in Turkey, a cis man uh, accused of homicide uh, has received penalty reduction uh, for the sake of his suite. Um, if we consider uh, common victim blamings uh, and social made solidarity, uh, the deficiency in civil and social punishment uh, could be connected to each other. Thank you for your time. Social punishment. I, I'm, I hope I've got it, got it correct. I mean, it is certainly true everywhere that more powerful and you know, rich and socially advantaged men um, are, are treated more uh, leniently. In the case of the two white college students that I wrote about who killed Pamela George, uh, you know, there was all kinds of concern by the court for their wonderful careers that they would now never have. And that, that story has endless installments I wish I could tell someday. But um, yeah, so 
it, it is true that that happens. And, you know, a, a bind that I constantly find myself in is that as a feminist, I don't, I don't really want to say that the answer is stiffer punishments. It's, you know, I, I want to think about abolition. I want to not feed the, <laughs> the prison industrial complex. I want to think about all of that. And I do find myself in a tight spot where people are saying, you know, where you seem to be going is uncriminalizing this. Uh, you know, really a lot, although I'm very clear that there can be no role for criminalizing the women. That That is out of the question. That has not uh, got to be. But I, I still, I admit to sort of not being able to really think about what is the solution here? What what do I want in, 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 in this case? I know very much what I would want if it were my sister or my, you know, but but that's not a politics. That's that's grief and, and and anger. So, what would I want to happen? Um, what would I want the law to say? And at this point, I I find myself sort of saying, well, let's try a few things first. Let's um, decriminalize it. But um, how do we then um, respond? to the violence that 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 happens so so routinely now that there are many advocates people who are upset with me for example about my views on on uh, sex work who say if you decriminalize that you got rid of the heavy hand of the law you would get rid of the violence and that completely goes against anything that i would argue because the violence while sustained and nurtured in the law does not originate there. It originates somewhere else. So I'm unpersuaded by that. Um, but this is part of what I set myself to think about this summer, because you know what has happened to me is I have become so narrow minded and dogmatic and I get into a fight every chance I get uh, with my students on this. This is very bad scholarship. I have to get out of that and start thinking seriously about what the problem is. So I don't really have an answer for you, but I appreciate your identifying a key problem and thinking about this. Thank you. Um, so I don't see a new question at all. So that our question session has ended. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. And it was an honor to host you here. So lastly, because of the pandemic, we find online alternatives for everything. Um, so can we take a souvenir photo without getting um, out of the Zoom? My friends or I can take screenshots. <laughs> Okay, I think um, they can take. And again, thank you very much for everything. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Good luck with all of you. Thank you. Take care of yourself.